All right. Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for sticking through to the ver the bitter end. Um, I'm actually uh, really excited about this last lesson. I think this is like one of the most fun ones. It's unlike some of the other lessons. It's a little less heavy on code and a little more related to sort of conceptual stuff about what's going on. So I um, encourage you to um, ask any questions that you have during the lesson. And then uh, if you wanna put them in the chat, I'll read them or you can unmute your microphone and go ahead and ask. So please feel free to ask. Um, so I wanted to uh, mention in the beginning, let's see, let's get to the lesson web page. I wanted to mention that um, there is a brief evaluation survey, and I would love it if you take a moment. I think it has three questions on it, so it's very short. So if you could take a moment to fill that out, I'd really appreciate it. There's a link at the top of today's lesson. The other thing that I wanted to say um, about the CoLab notebook, so um, the CoLab notebook mostly will work fine today, however, because the CoLab notebook is running in the cloud on a server somewhere else, any code that involves doing things to your local computer um, won't work. So for example, in the, in the homework example that we're gonna go over, there's a thing called web browser open new tab. Well, that cloud server doesn't have a web browser, so it's not gonna work. Um, similarly, um, I'm gonna show you the, um, the form-based advanced super cartoon checker, which is uh, you can try out for yourself. Um, that, that causes a little form to pop up and so it also won't work from the CoLab notebook. But in either of these cases, if you just copy and paste the code into Thani, it'll work. And most of the stuff that we're gonna do will work straight from the CoLab notebook. All right, so I mentioned the evaluation already. So today, mostly we're gonna talk about what, um, what is HTTP and how is it used to talk to APIs. The other thing is that um, there'll be a couple bits of sort of template code. Uh, in the past, we were seeing how you can load data from files on your local computer. And that's fine, except if you want to write code that somebody else is going to use, then you have to help them figure out how to get those CSV or whatever files. If you take those files and put them somewhere like GitHub, then you can make them available to anybody who wants to run your code without them having to download anything. So we're going to, I'm providing a little bit of template code for uh, how to load CSV files and also how to get um, JSON from an API. Both of these uh, kinds of retrieval are gonna um, use the requests module, which we'll talk about a little bit. And then the reader and dict reader uh, functions, which uh, we were in the CSV module, we are also gonna use um, to uh, process the files that we are reading the CSV files that we're reading in from the internet. Um, and then we'll, we'll spend most of the time talking about JSON, which was what we talked about last time. Um, so last time the discussion of JSON was like pretty theoretical, but this time we're gonna actually see what it's good for. So uh, let's start a little bit with talking about HTTP. So most people have heard of HTTP because like when you type a URL, it starts off with HTTP colon or HTTPS colon. And that is actually uh, referring to what's called the hypertext transfer protocol. So this was invented way back in the beginning of the web as a way um, for a local computer, which we call, uh, or, or software running on a local computer, which we call the client software, to communicate with a computer somewhere else, which we call the server. And the way this is done is with a, a URI. Um, a URI and a URL have some technical differences. You can, for this purpose, think of them as the same thing. 
So when you type a URL or a URI in the little box at the top of your web browser, um, what is happening when you press enter? Well, that URL is essentially telling the web browser, hey, this, there's this resource, this thing that exists somewhere else on the web, and I want, you, I, I want to try to get a copy of that. And so there's sort of an address part that helps the, the internet direct your request to that web server. And then you tell the web server what it is that you want, so which particular file or resource you want to get. And the other thing is there's also a thing called an accept header, which tells you if, it, if this thing is available in multiple forms or formats, what format do you want to get back? So an example of client software that everybody's used to is a web browser. So a web browser is a, is a, a program, it's client software, and it generally asks for web pages. So it's going to send what's called an accept header to the server saying, hey, I want an HTML web page. Then the web server, when it gets that request, is going to try to find out, well, do I know what that web page is? If it can find that web page, then it's going to send it back to the client or to the web browser through the internet, along with a status, um, a status number which indicates whether it was successful or not. So if it found the web page and is able to send it back, it'll send a status code of 200, and then the body of the response will be the actual web page itself. Now that web page looks really ugly if you look at the raw text that it's sending back because it's going to be marked up in HTML. Fortunately for us, the client software, which is the web browser, knows what to do with HTML and it'll take that messy HTML text document and turn it into a beautiful web page for us to look at. So all of this, this kind of interaction, the talking between the client and the server, is all going on behind the scenes when we're using something like a web browser. Um, however, if we are using Python, then the client software is not a, is not a web browser. It's actually the Python script that, um, that we are writing. So um, we will go ahead and try running the very first uh, example on the Colab notebook. And the requests module, for whatever reason, is not uh, a part of the standard Python library. And so you have to actually uh, install it in your instance of Python. If you're using the Colab notebooks, it's already installed. If you're using Anaconda on a local a Jupyter notebook, it's already installed. But if you're using something like Fani or some other, um, uh, or just running it from the command line, you'll have to actually install it before it'll work. So I, I'm not sure why this is the case because basically everybody uses requests. It's like one of the most, the best and most popular uh, module. So I'm guessing in some future uh, edition of Python, it'll become part of the standard library. Um, okay, so looking at this code, we import the request module, and then the first line of code basically says, from the request module, I want to run a function called get. Um, and essentially, we put in the um, the URL of the document that we would like for the server to send us, and then the get function sends it to the server and then takes the response that comes back from the server and puts it in a, uh, a uh, requests uh, object. So the request object is essentially the response from the server. And we can look at various things about that. So, for example, the status code, which is usually either 200, which means, hey, I was successful in sending it, or the dreaded 404, which you've probably seen before, which is, sorry, I can't find that file. This is what you get if it's a broken link. So let's go ahead and try running the, the first script. So we're asking for a web page, and this uh, if we want to see what the actual web page itself looks like, we can just paste it in another browser tab. 
So this is what the page looks like when it's rendered in a browser. Now, if we want to see what um, the uh, the what is actually being sent, um, instead of saying we want the status, we can uh, ask it to just send us the body of the text. And let's see what we get. Oh no, sorry, it's text. I forgot what it was. Oops. Let's try that. Okay, so here is what the server is actually getting or is actually sending to your web browser. It's this HTML. And as I said, luckily that the uh, web browser typically knows what to do with that. So um, it's not particularly useful to us in Python to be retrieving HTML uh, web pages because like, why would we want to do that? Um, if we could have a, a web browser do it for us and give us like a, a better um, and give us an actual uh, display it as an actual uh, web page. Okay, so I'm going to pause here for a moment and um, just ask if anybody has any questions about um, about what I said about um, the uh, interaction with a web server. Okay, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, so just to summarize what we've talked about so far, um, the get request is how you try to get a particular file from the server. Um, and then the depending on the, what the client is, uh, the client has to basically figure out what to do with that file. And so if we're writing a Python script, we have to basically decide in our code how to handle what comes back. So as I said, it, typically we're not really interested in getting HTML web pages unless we're doing web scraping, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, this is actually a really great way to get CSV files, and that is what I'm going to talk about next. So let's take a look at an example of reading from a CSV file from the internet. So you may recall this um, CSV file that we've looked at in a couple previous examples, the Metro Schools data. Um, so that is actually posted on GitHub as a as a text file. And so if, uh, if you look at this get command here, instead of asking for an HTML file, I'm actually asking for a CSV file. Now that CSV file is just going to come in as a big blob of text. One of the things when we talked about reading from files, <clears throat> we said that um, a file object is iterable. That means you can go through one line of the CSV file at a time and iterate through it and do whatever you want with it. Well, the problem is if you do a GET request for a CSV file from the internet, it doesn't come as an iterable object that we can step through. It just comes as a single uh, blob of text. So in order to be able to step through it on the basis of the, the new line characters that tell us where the end of each line is, we have to um, split the text apart into bits uh, by looking for the new line characters that are at the end of each line. So that's what we're doing here using the split command. And what the split command outputs is a list that consists of lines of text. <clears throat> then the next line, um, one of the problems is that if you uh, create a CSV file and it has essentially a hard return at the end of it or like a trailing new line, then you'll end up as your very last line getting some blank text. And that could throw you off because you're going to have a line that basically doesn't have any information in it. So this line here basically checks is there an empty last line? And if there is, get rid of it. And, and then after that, we can take that iterable thing that we made, the, uh, the list of text lines, and use the reader function that we saw last time. 
and then go through, step through each line of the file and put it into a list, uh, which we're gonna call schools data. And then down here, um, I'm telling it on line zero, which is basically the header row, um, get the set, get field number two, which has the name of the school, or I think the ID of the school, and then get um, the column number three, which has the name of the school. So this is gonna print, print the headers for those uh, two columns. And then we will step through each line of the school data, starting with one, we're skipping line zero because that's a header line, and go all the way to the end of the file. And then, uh, oh, look, I already ran this before, so it actually knows what those things are. And then as we step through each line of the table, put what the uh, school ID is, and then put the uh, school name. So let's go ahead and run that. And there we have the answer. So here is the first thing that it sent was from row zero, the column header for column number two, the column header for column number three, and then it steps through each row in the table and gives me the name of the school and its ID number. So this is all like pretty similar to what we did last time, except that this from this line down to here, we're just getting the text from the internet by the requests module instead of opening it up from a file. The last part where we can process just like we did last week. Uh, so there's a little embellishment that I have down here. Uh, so as we said last time, or maybe it was two times ago, it's annoying when you read in a CSV file to have to remember what column number has the ID numbers in it and what column number has the name in it. So if we, the, the, so the first part of this is basically similar, except that instead of using uh, CSV reader, we use dict reader. And dict reader doesn't care about blank last lines. And so the, the little extra mess we had to put in here to get rid of any empty last lines, we don't need to have. The dict reader will just go through and it'll read the headers and then it will use the headers as the key for each column. So after we step through each line and read it into a list called schools data, then we can now refer to um, the, the columns by the name of their headers. So we can say, I want in this line, I want the school ID, the value that's in the school ID column. And here's asking for the value that's in the school name. So what we're doing here, again, we're seeing some of the tricks that we had in earlier lessons. So here I am, um, I'm asking, what is the name of the school? And then um, I'm using this flag to find out as it steps through whether it was successful in finding the name of the school. And uh, so, if it, so it's gonna step through each line in the table and look to see, does that line, does the school name column have what the person typed in in it? And if it does, it'll give us the ID number and set the flag equal to true. But if it gets all the way through the whole table and it never finds the school, then it's gonna say, I can't find the school. So let's go ahead and try running this. So let's try, um, uh, I can't remember if Harris Hillman has a dash in it. So I'll just say Harris. Oh no, I couldn't find that. All right, let's try running it again. Uh, okay. Well, let's cheat and go find the name of the school. All right, let's try McGavick High.
Aha, okay, it found Megavachi. Now in theory, if I because I said here um uh okay, so I know the reason. If I want it to um so I'm asking is it equal to the school name? I should actually how could I change this? Does anybody know if I want it to just look for what they typed in in the name instead of being equal to the name? Well, let's change that around. All right. If you want to do that, then instead of using the equivalence operator here, you can say in. So you can ask, is the school name in the column that we're looking at? Now, if we run this, that's why when I tried to do um, Harris, aha, okay, the ID number for the school is, I should actually probably have it print the school name, but that should be Harris Hillman. Uh, and then as we said before, also, if we wanted to, we could make this case insensitive by, um, by putting dot lower here and uh, dot lower here. Let's see if that works. Okay, so it was able to find it even if I didn't capitalize it. All right, so this is using a number of the tricks that we have used in previous lessons, only now we are basically leveraging data that's on the internet instead of, instead of having to worry about either creating the data ourselves or um, uh, downloading the data and then loading it from a file on our local computer. Uh, does anybody have anything they want to ask about this, what we talked about so far here? Okay, I don't hear anybody um, asking. So um, for the rest of the lesson today, I'm going to be talking about APIs. Um, so it's probably good actually to start off by talking about like um, uh, what is an API and um, what's the difference between using an API and web scraping. So a lot of times people will say like, oh, I'm going to scrape this data from a certain website, but really they're using an API. Um, so what is the difference between the two? If you are doing web scraping, then you're trying to get information from just a generic web page. And as we saw earlier, the, the, the HTML in a generic web page is a mess. It's very hard to pick through for a, a program that you write to pick through the HTML and try to figure out what's going on in the web page because generally it's not structured data. If the web page has things like tables in it that are very well structured, then you can use uh, certain libraries. There's actually a good one called Beautiful Soup. I have no idea why it's called that, but um, called Beautiful Soup that is really good at, at picking through HTML files and trying to pull out structured parts of it and allow you to capture it and save it. But if it doesn't have structure, if, some, if it's just random text, it's really, unless you're Google, it's very hard to figure out what's going on in the page. Now, in contrast, an API is when the person who's running the web server is actually trying to make your job easy. So instead of having just a scrambled up mess that's in HTML, it's actually trying to provide you with structured text that's really easy to extract what you want out of it. It's, and, and typically, Instead of you having to look at the HTML and figure out what's going on, they'll actually have instructions telling you exactly how, what kind of data they're going to send, what kind of form it's in, and how you can ask for exactly what you want. And when you, get, when you request the data, it comes back to you in either JSON or XML, which are the two most common uh, forms of structured uh, text. And actually most APIs now return in the form of JSON, although some of the older ones um, still support XML. 
Okay, so let's talk about what exactly is an API. An API stands for Automated Programming Interface, and it's basically a special kind of server. So instead of you just sending like a random URL and then it tries to see if it has a file that corresponds to that URL, it has a special URL that's called an endpoint URL. And the endpoint URL is basically, when it gets sent to the server, it's basically a signal going, hey, I want to use your API. And so then the endpoint, so the URL itself is usually like a long thing that has a question mark in the middle of it. And so the first part that's in front of the question mark is like the, the, uh, the base URL, uh, which has a, a, the, the endpoint and um, and that base uh, sorry the the uh, the endpoint URL can is sometimes broken down into pieces so for example the GBIV API which is the one we're going to see in the first example has a base URL called api.gbiv.org slash v1 for version one of the API and then if you go to the instructions for the API, there's a number of different kinds of searches you can carry out. You can search for occurrences, you can search for taxon, you can search for um, other sorts of records. And so you can have a fuller base URL by tacking extra things. And the one we're gonna use is, has occurrence slash search tacked onto the end of it, which tells the API what kind of search that we wanna use. In order to know what sorts of endpoint URLs are available, you can uh, go to the developer guide and it'll basically tell you these are the kind of searches that you can do. Um, and then once you figure out the kind of search that you wanna do, then you have to send the API specific information about the search. So you can tell the API exactly what you want by sending what's called a query string. The query string are basically the parameters that come after that question mark. And so after the question mark, you end up with a series of key value pairs. We talked about this when we were talking about JSON, where the key is essentially like the description of the data field that you want, and then the value is the particular value that you're interested in. And you can specify multiple search criteria each search criterion is separated by an ampersand. And so uh, in this example down here, you can say, I want, I want the record that has an the ID number of 294, and I want the version of that record that's in English. So here's our two key value pairs that represent the parameters where I tell the API, this is what I want. Now, one of the tricky things about this is that um, there are certain rules about what kind of characters are allowed in URLs. And so if you are requesting like a, a search term that has weird characters like, I don't know, percent signs or amp, uh, ampersands or other things that are either not allowed or which have special meanings, then there's a kind of encoding that you have to do before you send those parameters. And fortunately for us, the request module is so awesome that it takes care of doing that encoding for us and we don't actually have to worry about that. Okay, so we'll look at an example in a minute of this. But before we do, I wanna talk a little bit about API etiquette. So um, there or, or some, some general things about uh, APIs. So if you um, are asking something very complicated, if you have to send something very complicated to the API, like for example, you are to, in, in the example we talked about here, we're only getting information from the API, but you can also send information to the API. Like for instance, you can upload a file. If you do that, there's a different kind of HTTP request called post instead of get. Um, and so it, it, there's a different uh, ways of doing that. The other thing is if you are trying to send information to the API um, and not just get information, then there's the potential that you could be doing mischief and uh, sending nasty and bad things to the API. So generally, 
if you're doing a post, the API is going to require some kind of authentication, like a password or something. You, this is almost always required if you're sending or writing data to the API, and sometimes even for reading. The reason for that is that you might, let's say you're trying to communicate with maybe Twitter's API, and Twitter is afraid of people trying to, like hackers trying to do a denial of service attack by sending like thousands and thousands of requests a second. And so if that happens, they want to basically be able to turn you off. So you can't, you can't make a request to the Twitter API without having a Twitter account. And then if you start abusing the API, they'll just disallow that particular account from, from doing writing. So the APIs that we're going to use here don't require authentication because they're really simple ones. But a lot of times, uh, re uh, authentication is required. And that does complicate the, the talking or the interacting with the API. Um, as I said before, we almost always get the data back in the form of JSON. Um, the other thing is that it's considered really rude to, tr to ask for too much from the API. Um, usually, the API is going to place limits. So they might say, you can ask for this, but you have to limit it to 500 records. Or you can ask for this, and we'll send you what you want, but we'll only send it 100 records at a time. So you can ask for the first 100, then you have to ask for the second 100, then you have to ask for the third 100. So sometimes you have to set up your script to do paging, to ask one for one page of re results at a time. And um, the other thing is that uh, you don't want to hit the API too fast. Uh, some APIs, like uh, for instance, the, the um, PubMed API will not let you request more than three requests per second, um, which sounds like fast, but really a Python script could make a thousand requests in a second. So you should also do what's called throttling, which basically means slow your script down so that you don't abuse the rules of the API. So <clears throat> one of the important parts of using an API, in addition to figuring out how to do it, is to also read the rules um, the, of, of how to be a, a good citizen, and also uh, how to do whatever kind of authentication might be required. So all of these things are kind of more advanced topics that we won't get into, but I did want to mention that um, earlier in this uh, spring, or no, I guess it was last fall, we did a class on APIs and web scraping that goes into more of this in detail, and those notes are online on the Python landing page uh, along uh, with the examples and things like that. So if you're interested, you can try out some of these more advanced things. So with that, I'm going to end the uh, sort of talking about APIs and what we can do is actually look at some examples. So we'll start by getting some data from uh, biodiversity data. Um, and then we'll take a look at a couple of the uh, examples that are listed in either the homework or the challenge problems. One of the problems, uh, I think it's homework number one, is to try to use the Twitter API. And um, to have the Twitter API, you have to have an account. And I actually have an educator's account. I can issue you with uh, an API account if it's something you want to play around with just email me and let me know and I'll give you an account. Um, I, can, I can do that quite easily. So just let me know if that's something that you're interested in trying. Um, and then the last two things, I'm going to show you Super Cartoon Checker and the International, uh, finding out where the International Space Station is. So let's take a look at those examples. So um, the uh, the, so here's an example of how you make a request to the Global Biodiversity Information Facilities API to ask for information about some occurrences. So an occurrence is basically a record that an animal or plant was found somewhere. And so um, remember I said we don't have to worry about, if we use the request library, we don't have to worry about encoding things um, if we use this uh, this method here, we instead of uh, 
creating the raw URL ourselves if we send it as a dictionary of parameters with the keys and values that we want, then if there is any kind of encode, uh, encoding that needs to happen, then requests will just do that for you. And so I can see this if I um, go ahead and do the request, and then instead of looking at the text that it sends back, I can look at the URL that it generated. Let's try doing that. So it's taking a minute because it's actually retrieving all of the data as well. <clears throat> Ooh, it's taking longer than a minute. There we go. Okay, so you can see here, spaces are not allowed in URLs. And so one of the things it's done is it's filled in those spaces with plus signs which is sort of like a shorthand in URLs for indicating that there should be a space in there. Okay, so that is just simply showing you what the URL is that it sent to the API. If we want to actually see what came back from the API, then instead of telling it to print the URL, we can uh, tell it to take the data and, and turn it into a Python data structure. So typically, if you request data from the GBIV API, it's going to send it to you as JSON text. But JSON text is not directly readable by Python. So this method here, or this uh, function here, says take the text that the API sends you back, parse it out, and then turn it into a Python data structure called data. And then we can work with it um, it's going to turn it into one of those complex data structures like you saw before. Now, of course, in order to know sort of like what you have, there needs to be some way to look at it. And so um, if I tell it to just print the data structure, I can, uh, I can do this. I'm only going to tell it to print record number zero because there's a whole bunch of records and it'll go flying down the screen. So here we see... Um, what we got back, it came back, and, and here we've turned it from JSON into uh, uh, a, this is, looks like uh, a Python dictionary. But it's really difficult to actually see what the structure of this is because it's going on and on and on as a single line. So there's actually a really um, a cool trick that we can do. We can take the data structure that it made and then turn it back into JSON, a JSON string, but that is prettified by, uh, a prettified and then indented with each new level um, by two spaces. So let's try running that. And now we see that the code we got back is better. Okay, and I also told it to do the whole thing. So we see there's a whole bunch of records that came back. Uh, it's a it's basically a dictionary of uh, or it's a list of dictionaries and each of these dictionaries here is a different record about some kind of occurrence. So what we can do and these are all occurrences that were recorded by a particular collector whose name was uh, William A. Haber. And so we can pull some information. He actually worked for Missouri Botanical Gardens, collecting a lot of stuff in Costa Rica. So we can pull out things like the locality where he found them, uh, things like the date that he found them on, which should be in here somewhere. Um, I don't see where that is. Uh, and then also what are like the genus and the species of the thing that he found. So here's uh, the genus and the species. So that's what I did in the last part of the script here. So basically, in each of the results that, that um, so the, the basic uh, top level of the re records that we got back were um, a, uh, a dictionary that had these key value pairs, but the, um, and, and so here we can see that actually there were 2,806 records 
in GBIV of specimens that were collected by William A. Haber. And GBIV will not send them all to us at once. It's only sending us the first 20. So we should just realize we're only getting 20 out of 2,806. And, but the, the important part that gets sent back is the key that is called results has a value that is the dictionary that contains all of the results. So if we go down here, we say, okay, pull out the results uh, value. And then since that's a dictionary, we can step through each of the results in that list. And each of the results in that list is a dictionary that has uh, keys of all of these different things, states and provinces, and all the various things we want to know. So we're going to ask, uh, print the species, print the date, and then say observed at, and print the locality and the country. And then if those things are not found, so here we're using try, accept. So it's going to try to do that, but if any of those things are missing, it'll just do nothing instead of crashing. So let's go ahead and try running that. So here we go. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know what Aaron, Aaron Danella is. We could copy that and go into Google. Aaron Danella is some kind of grass. Okay, that's cool. So he observed some kind of grass in 1998, and the place he found it was in Cuenca's del Lagarto in a lower community near a cliff edge in Costa Rica. So anyway, these are only the first 20. If I wanted to get all 2,000, I'd have to have my script uh, ask over and over again for another 20. I think you can also, in your uh, request, you can tell it that you want more than 20. So I could add an additional parameter here saying, I forget what the limit is. It might be 200 records. And so instead of having to do them 20 at a time, I could tell it, give them to me 100 at a time or something like that. But the default is 20. Okay, well, that's a, a little bit uh, overwhelming. Uh, but this is like actually a very typical sort of way that you, re that you interact with an API. You look at the API guide, you figure out what kind of searches you can do, and then what sorts of information you have to send to the API to do the specific search you want. And then you also have to generally look at the API to figure out what kind of information it's going to send you and how is that data structured. This is actually getting a, getting a dictionary, uh, sorry, getting a list of dictionaries with each dictionary being key value pairs is super, super common. This is like probably half of the APIs to send back information like this. So you could look at this, use this code example as like a template for interacting with some other APIs. Okay, anybody uh, have any questions before we move on to the other example about um, what we did here or about APIs in general? Okay, well, I am going to end this with uh, two things. Uh, the first one is um, a, I just want to show you the answer to um, one of the uh, challenge problems that's down at the end of this lesson here. So um, this is just if you want to have fun. So throughout these lessons, I've used um, cartoon characters as an example, and we did stupid little scripts that ask uh, who does Mickey Mouse work for and stuff like that. And the stupid and annoying thing about those is that if you didn't ask about Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse, you were out of luck. Well, in this, uh, now that we know how to go to APIs and get information from the internet, we remove all those limits of what we can ask for. So this script, which I'm gonna just demonstrate, you can pick through the code yourself to see how it works. Um, it actually uses a cleaned up file, CSV file that I, I cleaned up 
I actually downloaded it from the internet of, of like thousands of cartoon characters and what their wiki data ID numbers are. And so the script, so when you type in the name of a cartoon character, it first reads that CSV file, goes through and tries to find the cartoon character on that list. And then if it has a, and then if it, finds it, it has the Wikidata ID number. And so Wikidata is sort of like a community um, maintained database, it's on the internet. And it has just crazy amounts of information about all kinds of things. And so if you find the cartoon character that you want, you can, the script will then go, do a request to the Wikidata API and basically say, tell me everything that you know about this cartoon character. And the cool thing is, if it doesn't have the information that you want to know, you can go to Wikidata, you can add the missing information yourself, and then later when you come back and run the script, it'll be there. The other thing that is cool about this is that I use the, um, the same uh, uh, graphic interface that we used in the earlier example for the Latte Maker script, only now it's actually doing a real thing. So I'm gonna go ahead, as I said, since this is using a graphical interface, um, it won't run off of the uh, Colab notebook, so I've got it running on uh, Thani here. So anyway, if I run it, um, it will um, open up a, uh, this little window here. It says, enter all or part of a character name. So I'm gonna have it search for George Jetson. George Jetson works for Hanna-Barbera. Okay, cool. So it found George Jetson. Now I'm gonna tell it to look on Wikidata and see what it can find. So George Jetson's, let's see, spouse is Jane Jetson. This is probably a little small. I don't know if I can make this bigger. Let's try. Okay, I can't make this bigger. Um, anyway, you can try it yourself, but we can also put in stuff like, um, Superman, uh, and then have it search for Superman. So it turns out that Superman is actually like a, 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 a has several versions. There's generic Superman, whose enemy is Lex Luthor, but there's also composite Superman. And if you do something like, um, let's see, if you just type in super, Oh my goodness, there's Super Patriot, Super Thief, Super Goof, Super Gilbert, Super Woman, uh, and so on. So if we want to know, I don't know, Super Goof, who is Super Goof? You can put that up here and then look up Super Goof on Wikidata. Super Goof is in the Mickey Mouse universe, said to be the same. He's Goofy's alter ego. Okay, well, anyway, if you're interested, you can try this out yourself. But the point here is that like by putting together all these tools we've learned about and actually using the internet as a data source, these sorts of limitations of like, well, we have to have, we have to type this in ourselves or we have to download some file, go away and you essentially have this unlimited universe of data that's out on the internet. Um, so I, I recommend if you're interested in Wikidata that you learn more about it because it's super exciting. So we have run out of time, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, stay online. If anybody has to go, uh, please feel free just to leave. But um, I am going to go ahead and try doing what I said I would never do, which is live coding and work through the um, International Space Station example, which is um, the, um, the homework number two example down at the bottom here. So like I said, if you, um, uh, if you have to leave, uh, thanks for coming. If you don't have to leave, stick around as long as you want and, um, and please take the time to fill out the evaluation if you're able. So I'm gonna jump down here to, um, okay, so here's the problem. There's a very simple API that will just give you the latitude and longitude of the International Space Station. You don't actually have to send any parameters or anything to it. You just simply send this URL to the API 
and it's going to send you back JSON that basically looks like this. So you can see it's like super simple JSON. Um, and so if I just uh, send, uh, let's see here, actually, let's go to the Colab notebook. Um, so here is the starter code. Uh, if I just click on this, so it's sent me back the data in the form of JSON, uh, and I've turned it into a data structure. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to figure out how do we pick out the bits that we want. So what we're going to try to do is to pull out the latitude and longitude um, from here and then create a URL for Google Maps so that it'll put a, a drop pin on the map. So if we look at the structure here, we can see that, um, that this thing is a dictionary and it has a, a key of timestamp, a key of ISS position, and a key of message. We don't care about timestamp and message. What we want is ISS position. So if we put in the first square brackets that we want ISS position, that's going to drill us down to this point. Now, on the next level, we see we have another dictionary that has key of latitude and a key of longitude. So if we want to get the latitude, we just simply put square brackets and then say latitude. Um, so let's go ahead and copy this and put it in here. Actually, we don't care about printing the data anymore. Let's just have it print the latitude and see if that works. Okay, cool. Let's run that. Okay, so it pulled the latitude out of the JSON that came back. So I need to know the latitude. I also need to know the longitude. And the longitude is just uh, basically just like the latitude, except that I need to use the longitude key. So let's just copy this line. If it'll let me copy. And paste it in here. And change this to longitude. Change this to longitude. And then let's have it print latitude and longitude. All right, let's see if that works. OK, we got the latitude and longitude. Now, um, the last thing that um, we need to do then is to create a URL in the form that Google requires in order to put something on a map. So if you've ever looked at the URL, um, you see it's in this specific form. Um, so you have to insert the latitude here and here. Uh, and also insert it here and here. And then there, you can also choose the zoom level. So like if you want to do the, on the level, the, um, the uh, magnification of like street level, you have to use a zoom level of like four, uh, sorry, a zoom level of like 11. Uh, if you want to see like the entire globe, then you want to use a zoom level of, um, of four. So what I'm going to do uh, is copy this and then go back in my code. The first thing that I want to do is to just um, have it print this whole thing. Uh, and then, oops, let's see. Actually, um, yeah, okay, we can start with that. All right, so it printed that. But the problem is it did not substitute in the latitude and longitude. So what I need to do is go in here and in place of, so I need to take this out. And then in where, um, in the space where the latitude was, I need to have it substitute latitude. 
Okay, then I'm going to just do copy this little bit of code here. And so in place of, well, I also want latitude to be in here. So let's paste that in there. Okay, so I'm substituting latitude in there. And then here is where I need to substitute longitude. So let's put longitude here instead of latitude. And then that I'm going to put in here. And then just because it's easy, I'm going to go ahead and hard code the zoom level as four. It probably would be better to put that in a variable so that you could change that. Uh, okay, let's try running the script now. Okay, so now you see it substituted in my values for latitude and longitude. So if I click on this, and this will actually work even if, um, because my web browser is, my local web browser is interpreting this as a URL. So if I click on it, it will actually open a new tab in my web browser. And that's where the International Space Station is right now, over Montana. Now there's one more trick that we can do, which is kind of cool, but you will not be able to do it in the Colab Notebook. And that is to use this thing called web browser dot open new tab. And then, so what you can do is um, instead of just printing this URL, we can take this URL and um, assign it to a variable called uh, Google URL. And then um, say, uh, web browser open as the last line. And I guess I called it Google map URL, not Google URL. Okay, and so what this will do is take that URL, open a new tab on my browser, and then open that URL in the tab. Now I have to also say import web browser because that's not in the standard library. Um, I don't remember whether you have to actually install it or not. But let's go ahead and like I said, this will not work. The, the opening a tab in your web browser thing will not work. Um, okay, why is Donny not coming up? Okay, here we go. So I'm just going to actually um, delete the cartoon checker code and paste this in and see if it works. So, uh, invalid syntax. Um, hmm. Oh, I have gotten rid of the print statement, but I forgot to get rid of that last quotation mark. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, wow, it popped open my browser. Oh, now we see that since we last ran this, the uh, International Space Station has moved from Montana to over South Dakota. Wow, pretty soon it's going to almost be over Nashville. All right, well, anyway, this is, a, I think, kind of a, a pretty simple uh, and um, but very fun and cool example of how to use an API uh, to do a fun thing. And there's all kinds of embellishments. You could, like, have it run the script every minute and update the position of the space station or you could i don't know save them and try to make it into a movie or <laughs> whatever there's a lot of embellishments that you could make on this but um anyway this is just a simple example of how you can use an api so with that i'm going to go ahead and ask one more time if there's any questions and if not we'll just call it a day for or call it a semester for the lessons all right. Um, yeah, okay. The formatted output of this Haber specimen collection date is in random order, not sorted alphabetically. Um, yeah, so I think the, the order of the um, data is just, it, it, the most likely thing is we're getting it in the order that it's occurring in the database. So um, in order to know whether it's possible to pre-sort the results, I think you would have to look at the um, 
the G pit, the G biv A. So, so there will be two approaches you could take. One is to look and see if the GBIV API has a key value pair that you can spec that you can send saying, I want this sorted by blah blah blah. And if that's the case, then when it comes back, the first 20 records you'll get will be the first 20 in alphabetical order. The other way, way to do it would be to retrieve all, however many there were, 2,300 records, and then do a sort on, so they, when you read them in, they would be like a dictionary, uh, sorry, a list of dictionaries, and you could perform a sort operation on that dictionary and sort them out by whatever key you wanted, and then print them off in that way. So you could either, if it's not available as an actual um, search request from the API, you could just do it on the client side on in, within your program and do the sorting there. Um, any other questions? I'm just going to open the, the GBIV REST API here as an example. Here, the, um, if I click on occurrence, this basically um, tells you, um, I'm not sure why this is graying out on me here. Um, oh, I have to accept the terms of use, that's why. Uh, yeah, so if we, Oops, this is an example record. If we want to know how to use the occurrence API, these are basically the instructions. So here is search, and then, ooh, gosh, here's all the parameters. Let's see if there's any one called sort. Hmm. It doesn't come up. Anyway, so what you'd have to do would be look through um, all of these things here and find out if there's one for, um, oh no, there is faceting. I haven't really played around with this too much, um, but this is basically where you would have to uh, look to find out um, whether it's possible to do the sorting in here. All right, let's see another question. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's uh, that may be it for questions. Um, if you have any questions in the future about Python or want help with something, just remember that the DISC office is here to help people out um, and don't be afraid to email me. So if there aren't any further questions, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop recording and also um, end the call.